time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Hardy Burt, noted correspondent and author. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Corliss Lamont, American Labor Party representative. Doc Dr. Lamont, uh, our viewers, of course, many of them, uh, know that you are a somewhat controversial political figure and I'm sure they welcome you tonight and will extend to you the same degree of tolerance that they extended to the views expressed here uh, on their last program by Senator McCarthy. Now tonight sir I believe you are a candidate for the United States Senate in New York is that correct? That is true it's my first campaign for political office. And, uh, and, and uh, you are the candidate for the American Labor Party in New York. That's true. And is that party affiliated with the Progressive Party nationally? Yes, uh, our uh, national ticket uh, for president has Vincent Hallinan and for vice president, Charlotta Bass. And now, the American Labor Party is the New York unit of that party. Now that's the party that uh, our viewers remember was headed by Mr. Wallace in 1948. Correct. Is that, that's yes. correct, sir. Now, sir, uh, you are, uh, have been known uh, through most of your active lifetime, I believe, as an American who was generally friendly toward the Soviet Union. Is that correct, sir? Do you, would you so classify yourself? I think you could say that, yes. May I ask a question here, uh, uh, doctor, uh, about the great issue in the world, of course, today is whether we can have peace with Russia. We are spending billions of dollars on the premise that uh, we have to stave off Russian attack and so forth. We're sending troops abroad to Europe and all that. Now, do you think it's possible to make peace with Russia without uh, force of arms? I certainly do think it's possible, and of course, if you resort to force of arms, that will result in a terrible Third World War, which nobody can win. I believe that in spite of the Soviet Union's mistakes, which I think are many, and in spite of mistakes on the American side, we can get together over the conference table and wake these things out, making a start with relaxing the tensions that are existing in the world today. Just what would be your method in doing that, getting together with Stalin? That's what you would have to do. Well, yes, I would approve of a, perhaps a five-power conference or a two-power conference on a top level with Churchill, Stalin, Truman, whoever is president of the United States, and carrying out the idea that uh, the anti-communist Nehru suggested recently of talking these things over in a five-power conference around the conference table. Now, there have been many such conferences as these, and uh, we've usually been disillusioned. Why do you think this time that it'll work out? I don't promise it will work out, but of course I believe we should make immediate steps toward relaxing these tensions by getting an immediate ceasefire in Korea, and then perhaps letting China into the United Nations, and then restoring world trade, which has been disrupted over the past few years. How do we get a ceasefire? Well, I think that the best plan that has been suggested is to let the prisoner of war issue at present go over for settlement between four neutrals, Switzerland, Sweden, Poland, and Czechoslovakia, and let that be settled after the ceasefire and truce has been made on the present basis. I think the North Koreans and the Chinese would agree to such a compromise and that it could be worked out and well, save this endless slaughter which is going on over there in Korea. Well, sir, now, uh, in order to catch your views properly, sir, is it true to say, we, you mentioned that you were one of the Americans who was generally friendly towards Soviet Union. Now, you made several trips to, to Russia, didn't you, during the 30s? I made two trips, Mr. Huey, in 1932 and 1938. Uh, now, and, and during that, that period, uh, you were one of the Americans who thought that there was something enormously hopeful for mankind going on in Russia. That's right, but I was never an apologist for them. I always saw the mistakes and the evils in the Soviet Union. It seems to me that any country has both it, its good and bad sides, and that's certainly true of Russia. Uh, now, for instance, the purge trials in 1937, 
Uh, you were one of the Americans who thought that those trials were properly and were honorable trials and, and that the government, the Soviet Union, was proper in, in, in carrying out that purge. Well, I think that innocent people suffered in that purge, Mr. Huey, but so far as the great Moscow trials were concerned, I think that they were genuine, and I have a supporter in Winston Churchill, who in one of his books said that he believed they were necessary, though regrettable. Now, you have also, uh, is it fair to say that, uh, that you've been generally critical of organized religion, and the Christian religion particularly? Well, um, uh, I've been critical of uh, theology and political ideas in the churches, Mr. Huey, but naturally I support the New Testament ideals and teachings of Jesus and uh, in my own philosophy, bring those in constantly. You, it's, it's been your belief that the Christian church in Western Europe, for instance, uh, has been a, a, a reactionary political instrument. Well, I would always want to be specific on that and, and say what church and exactly what was their policy, because many churchmen, many Catholics too, have taken a liberal policy in social affairs and are fighting for international peace today. I'm unwilling to make any overall condemnation of a church, a religion, or a country. Now, you have also been a member or an officer of a number of organizations that have been labeled subversive by the government of the United States. Now, sir, do you have any, any regrets uh, as to those memberships? Well, I can't think that I do, Mr. Huey. As a matter of fact, the whole subversive listing, it seems to me, was <coughs> unconstitutional and illegal. And it was carried out, as you know, without giving any of these organizations a chance to testify and answer the charges against them. Well, sir, now, with that, with that background, what do you regard as a candidate for the United States Senate? What do you regard as the most important issue before the American people today? Well, I think there are two most important issues, if I may put it that way. The restoration of civil liberties for everybody in this country, capitalists, workers, socialists, communists, the enemies of communists, uh, Catholics and atheists and everything else. And the second big issue is international peace and disarmament. Now those two issues I am emphasizing in my campaign and of course they are tied up together. Well now on the first issue, the restoration of, of civil liberties, I take it by that you mean that, that civil, civil liberties are threatened today, that they need restoring. Oh, more than threatened, they have been suppressed right and left here, and indeed it has gone over from the field of a governmental violation to a non-governmental violation in private entertainment fields like uh, radio, even television, movies, and publishing. Would, would you say that uh, Senator McCarthy is a, is a part of that threat? I'm afraid he is, because McCarthy has kept the American people stirred up over uh, an alleged threat of communist insurrection here, and it seems to me has gone much too far in the direction of suppressing, actually, the Bill of Rights and making everybody scared to death, so that people now adopt what they call self-censorship uh, in order to uh, not go out on a limb and uh, not stick their necks out. They just keep quiet. Well, Millions you, of you Americans. say making everybody scared to death. Do you believe that a very large number of Americans are living in fear today of Senator McCarthy and what he stands for? Well, not so much of McCarthy himself as the, the, the fear that he has stirred up, the fear of government people losing their jobs because they're accused of some vague relationship to a communist organization back in 1932. All this I consider going pretty far astray. But it's not only McCarthy, the Democrats have a man like that, and his name is McCarran. And he is just as bad, in my opinion, and more powerful, actually, in the Senate of the United States. Well, sir, now, on this problem of peace, which uh, I believe that mo both major parties have found to be the issue that more people are interested in, now, uh, uh, in, in Western Europe, you've expressed in it your opinions on Korea. In Western Europe, are you critical of our maintaining troops in Western Europe? Well, I, I am indeed. I think that it's unnecessary. I don't think that there is really a danger of Soviet military aggression in Western Europe because that isn't the way the Soviets wait. They wait through propaganda and taking advantage of bad economic conditions. Now, as it happens, we are bringing about bad economic conditions in Western Europe. That's one of the great troubles with our policies. Doctor, let me interrupt right here to ask this question because it is pertinent. Uh, suppose we withdrew all uh, financial aid and all of our troops from Europe. Uh, do you think that the communists would pretty much leave Europe alone? Do you think Europe, it's, uh, the European countries themselves would go communist internally? Not necessarily. I believe myself and hope 
that the European countries of England, France, and Italy might uh, establish reform governments, labor governments, such as you have in England today. But they would have no allegiance to Russia, you say? Not necessarily. There would still be strong communist movements in those countries. But what America has done, it seems to me, through foisting this armaments program on them and disrupting east-west trade is to depress their living standards and in that way open the gates to the communist parties more than before. Because communists, as you know, thrive on economic misery and on bad economic conditions. Uh, doctor, as a final question, uh, would you tell our audience what kind of America you would like to see during the next four years? Well, I believe America is a great country with a great tradition, but that that tradition has been betrayed since the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt. I believe that with the reestablishment of peace, we can reestablish civil liberties here, and then start a march, renew a march in America toward economic security and abundance for everyone in this country. Is it fair to say that you are a socialist and that you want to see uh, peace restored and then you want to see this government proceed further in the direction of socialism? That's right, toward planned socialism with democratic means putting it into effect and not revolution. You think private property should be owned by the state? Uh, well, not all private property, Mr. Bate, uh, but the main means of production and distribution, yes. Well, sir, I'm, I'm certain that our viewers have enjoyed these forthright views from you, sir, and thank you very much for being with us. The opinions expressed this evening are necessarily those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Corliss Lamont, American Labor Party representative. It's World Series time again. The best days of the year for baseball fans. And this year again, the World Series is Longine time. Yes, all umpires of both American and National Baseball Leagues Use Longine watches exclusively for timing all the games, including the World Series. Truly, the most honored watch in sports is Longine, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now that's why throughout the world, no other name on a watch carries the prestige of Longine the world's most honored watch in sport. The watch of first choice with discriminating people the world over. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Timely picked the winner on the CBS television network.